Good afternoon. Uh, I have been invited to to speak to you guys about um, the real world asset or real world asset projects um, that we have been working with around the globe in the different different regions, including North America and uh, and EMEA and 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 APAC. But really, the the uh, 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 the question that we have to ask ourselves each time is what are the regulators stating and how are they using blockchain to, to tokenize bonds, treasury assets, you know, government, government backed uh, uh, assets that are used as collateral. And what we're going to do is take a look at really the, the common themes that, that we see with each of the regulators. Okay. Um, so we'll, so we'll, we'll start to understand privacy, control, and interoperability, and what that means and what they're looking for. Okay. And then we'll also take a look at uh, at the existing blockchain networks that are out there and and how they compare. Uh, and then they're going to introduce you to the Canton network to the extent that uh, that people don't understand that and why that's important and what people are doing around the globe with that. Okay. Um, and then the last two aspects of it is we'll take a look at um, some of the use cases as uh, um, that are being done across the globe, and finally what what can be done in the Korea market. Okay. Uh, first, it's it's important to understand that the regulators are are generally interested in tokenization. I think we all know that, okay? but what they're stating is they're stating things like okay, you need to be able to. Um, you know, show that you can create settlement efficiency, but you have to have privacy with that. You cannot show data uh, uh, across the board. But in, in addition to that, if we're creating blockchains, uh, different blockchain applications, right, we need to make sure that they're interoperable. Okay? These are statements that the regulators are, are stating um, in different markets. And, and so the good news is, is that, that they're interested and excited about it, and they're becoming educated on it. Uh, um, but you definitely need need to 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 show certain aspects in order to get these projects done. Yeah. Um, and and the three areas that that we're seeing, um, uh, it, you know, that's consistent acro across the regions, is uh, pr show that you you can have data privacy control over uh, over the application and interoperability. So if we take a take a look at the at the three of those. Um, First, you know, privacy is if you're going to uh, um, tokenize and create real-world assets and exchange those, uh, you know, across regions, you need to show that there's granular data privacy. Right? You need to show that um, data is not, whether it's personal data or data about the asset, is not exposed to different entities uh, th that are involved in the process. Right? Um, an example of of the of the regulation is you know very common commonly known in in as um, GDPR right was in, implemented in 2018. Okay. Um, the second aspect is control, and what they want you to do is demonstrate that you have control over every aspect of the life cycle. That that there aren't third parties that 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 are not approved that are coming into the coming into the cycle. Um, they want to understand that you're not dealing with sanctioned entities, um, and so and that is that is very clear um, in some of the Basel Committee recommendations around how to treat you know char capital charges um, for different assets if you cannot prove this. You know, you know, effectively, what they're saying is if you're doing something on a public blockchain, you need to take almost 100% capital charge on that. Um, and then the third theme is really around interoperability. So if we're creating these different networks, these different blockchain networks, they need to speak with each other. They need to be able to transact with each other. And, um, and it's very important that we're not just creating different data silos that exist today, um, which is part of the problem. So if we take a look at these three, these three components of what's required, uh, there's really a case for, um, you know, there's public public blockchains, and then you can choose a, a permission blockchain. That's what's that's what's generally available in the decision that, that people have to make. Um, but really, there's a case for 
what, what we would call a public permission network. Right? There's no reason why you should have to decide I have to go fully on a public chain or a permission chain. And if we look at the, if we look at the public chains, um, they, they, they've done a really good job of showing us that interoperability is, it, it, um, it, it works very, very well on those chains. Right? And it's a, it, it's, they introduced us to it. It's, it's really a great concept that you can build an application and have it interact with any other application on the Ethereum network, for example. Um, the issue is, is that you sacrifice some of that privacy and that control that, that's required. Obviously, the data is the data's exposed. Everyone can see it. You have third-party miners that come in to validate a transaction. That's not acceptable to the regulators. So then many say, well, let's, let's choose a, um, a, a permissioned blockchain. And that will, um, you know, you'll obviously take back some of that control and, the, and, and you have the data privacy, but you lose the interoperability. So if you're building two different uh, blockchain applications, even on the same, the same network or same protocol, those do not interoperate interoper with each other. So you've actually created a, a, a walled garden uh, where, where the assets can't move freely or talk to each other. And if we look at the examples that are, um, you know, just a couple of the examples of the different networks that are out there, as it relates to these three key components, there's really some important aspects to understand. Right? Um, if we take, a, you know, a public Ethereum-based blockchain network or application, it, as, as I mentioned earlier, you have really, really strong interoperability, but you do not have the privacy uh, or control that's required by the regulators. But if we step into uh, Hyperledger Basu, which, which is permissioned, right, uh, you, you, you do get some of the data privacy. Okay? It's still not as strong as it needs to be in many cases, as we've seen with the Central Bank of Brazil and their CBDC project. Um, but, but you lose that interoperability. Similar with R3 Corda, okay? you much, much stronger data privacy uh, features in, in the system, right? um, but you cannot interact. You cannot have two different versions of R3 Corda that would interact with each other. Right? The Canton network is, it, it, it does not require you to make sacrifices in any of three of these areas. Right? There needs to be sovereign applications that everybody can make the decisions, the application owners can make the decision to maximize what they need for their use case and not have to sacrifice one of these areas uh, to, to, to gain in the other. And it's very important that the, you know, the regulators are, are understanding this now and they're starting to ask and show me you know, if, if, when, 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 when you're bringing an application to market, you need to show them the privacy, the independent control, and the interoperability as it relates to the regulated assets that they're dealing with or real-world real assets. Okay. Um, I think this is, this is evident when really you start to look at the numbers of the volume of, of, uh, of assets that are transacted on the different networks. Okay. The wider ecosystem for real world assets, it has just, just under 4 billion, 3.3 billion um, in assets that are traded. Well, if you look at the Canton network, because of the strict privacy control and interoperability features, you're looking at almost a thousand times more assets that are available in the market. And this is where the scalability comes in because you're not limited and you're not making decisions about how your blockchain network should be working because, because there might be a limitation in that application. Okay, so now that we've, we've discussed that, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the Canton network and um, what's being done around the globe. Um, just to give, just to walk through some examples that that uh, that we see in different areas, you know, you've got you start with tokenization platforms, right? The large, you know, global banks, um, Goldman Sachs, HSBC, BNP, 
they are using the Canton blockchain as their digital asset platforms. Okay? The reason they are doing that is because they understand that and have worked with the regulators to show them that that privacy exists right? and they have full control over how that, how that application has been built. Okay? And then they know that as they, as they transact with others in the marketplace, they can have native interoperability with any other blockchain that is on the same protocol, which is Canton. Okay. Um, some of the other examples that, that make up that 3.3 trillion um, is, is Broadridge and repo, repo processing of trades. Okay? They're not tokenizing the assets into the, 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 to the repo themselves, but what they've done is it created a post-trade process that removes the friction out of, um, out, from trade confirm all the way through to settlement of that, of that repo or unwinding of that repo. Right? The types of volumes that they're seeing are 1.5 trillion per month of repo. Okay? These, are, these are significant transactions that are taking place and the reason they've been able to scale goes back to those three areas of privacy, control, and interoperability um, that, that, that's allowed them to scale to that point. Um, another, another example um, that I'd like to point out uh, is um, the Hong Kong Exchange. And what they have done is they've built an application and a workflow that allows for foreign investors to invest in the Chinese equities market. Okay? The Chinese equities market trades on a T plus zero basis. The rest of the world is T plus one or even more. And, and they, they've essentially created the workflows to remove all of that friction that, um, that, that would occur in transferring something from um, a foreign entity into, into China, and, and they were able to do that uh, via, via those, those three components that, that we keep mentioning. Okay, so what does is, what is the entire network look like? This is inclusive of most of the examples. Um, and you have, you have entities across the globe that have built their own individual blockchain networks. So if we, you know, we talked about Hong Kong Exchange, the Synapse product, we talked about HSBC, but you can see something like Versana, which has consolidated all of the leveraged loans in the, in the US and European markets across eight, eight, uh, eight different agent banks, okay? And created one ledger based upon each one of their, each, each one of their um, individual system of record for those loans, okay? But w when we look at the use cases, it's not requiring tokenization to be the starting point, right? We've got We've got customers that are, are building applications, investment banking, okay, trading, clearing and settlement. Okay. And, and most importantly, where you'll see a lot of the groups down there is, um, is around post-trade processing. Right? And that post-trade processing is where a lot of the risk exists in the clearing and settlement process. Uh, and, and companies are starting to realize that if they automate those processes, they can, the, the, that, that removal of risk will ultimately bring more investors into the asset class. Okay, um, just to highlight one, one really nice example when you start to, to bring in the interoperability aspect is that if we think about global collateral and collateral changing hands across regions, right. um, today there's, there's $230 trillion worth of eligible collateral. Well, that utilization rate is just around 10%. Okay. Um, so the question is, is, if we increase that utilization rate, what does that do? That obviously increases liquidity um, and, and, and helps everybody in the market. Okay. So what's been done is you take three of the largest CSDs in the world, that being DTCC uh, in the US, which is the primary CSD for, for uh, US equities and US treasuries, and you bring in, um, you add 
Euroclear, that is the, the primary CSD for uh, UK gilt and euro bonds, and then HKMA, which is um, they, they issue and are the primary CSD for Hong Kong bills and notes. Right? They each have their own individual application. They have, they have sovereignty over that application. They define the privacy and the control aspects who can access their own individual systems. But because of the interoperability now, those three independent blockchain applications, because they're all on the same protocol of, in the Canton protocol, can now transact with each other and collateral can move from, from DTCC in this example and be posted to HKMA without the physical asset being moved. It's just locked using the blockchain technology. This is, uh, you know, this is, the, this is really what many are calling the holy grail and, and where blockchain can provide the benefits. Because if you think about um, without having that native interoperability, the only way to do this with existing technology would be um, if, if the three of those companies got together and decide, had to decide um, and design and build one system, one single system or a SaaS type system. That will never happen, right? There's, there's, too much, uh, there's, there's, there's too much detail involved and too many nuances in each one of the markets uh, for them to get together and try to agree on now that. So they have their own applications that they have built and designed uh, and they, they, they interoperate with each other. Okay. okay, so finally, if we start to apply this to, we think about the Korean markets and you know, it, it, how, you know, what can be done here to drive you know, domestic and foreign investment, uh, uh, what we're talking about is really creating straight through processing across the, the life cycle of these different asset classes. Okay? And ultimately, that will, that will increase, increase the interest uh, of, uh, of, of local and foreign investors um, to increase liquidity. Okay? And you know, I think the, the stat that's been thrown around is that 3.6% uh, of, of, of Korean treasury bonds um, are utilized today. You know, if you can if you can make it easier for people to invest in the asset class by connecting different systems and and the, those assets freely transferring between different parties uh, you're definitely going to be able to increase that utilization rate okay. um, it's also when when you have this type of, of you know technological capabilities then you uh, you, you know you're, you have the ability to create all new financial markets that, 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 that don't exist today because you've removed friction from the process uh, and you've given people, given the, the, the people um, the, the ability to, 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 to invest in these new asset classes. Yeah. And then just finally, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, um, you know, the regulators are, 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 are very comfortable that if you can show them that, you, that you're maintaining the, the, the data privacy um, the control, and then have the ability to interoperate, uh, um, you, you'll, you'll satisfy all of, all of their needs. Um, so these are the types of projects that are, that are happening um, across the globe. Uh, um, and and, and you know, each one of these cases, they, they have worked with the regulators in some cases. Sorry, I said each one. In most of these cases, they've worked with regulators to show them how you know, they're not changing the process. They are, they are using you know, better technology to connect and remove that friction uh, in the process, and the regulators uh, have definitely have definitely accepted this and are, and, and are continuing to uh, encourage people to do more of that. So, with that, you know, I appreciate the time. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has. Uh, it's a good opportunity to. Uh uh, you know, listen, you're, you know, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, one question is actually, you know, when I survey a tokenization of uh, tokenized bond in Korea, and only two uh, entities we have, Shinhan Bank and also KB Bank only, 
when I survey more than 100 tokenized bond issuers, uh, we, we, I could find out there are some volatility also, uh, fluencies of, you know, uh, trading. So what is your recommendation on the Korean market? So uh, as you mentioned before on, a, on a, your show, I found that uh, could a local, you know, uh, tokenized bond, you know, government bond will uh, be traded by internationally easily. So with your DAML uh, smart contract systems, how could you support the Korean market? Yeah, so, so if you look at um, the example of DTCC and Euroclear and HKMA, what they did, what they started with was they said, I'm going to just prove in the local market that I can take an existing uh, um, US Treasury or a Euro bond in the case of Euroclear, um, and I can create a digital representation of that asset. So they, don't, they didn't change the way that the US Treasury was issued. That's where, that's where the regulators get a little uncomfortable. So they're creating a digital twin, uh, and then they, they automated the process from after post-origination all the way through uh, um, to posting it as collateral within their local, own local markets. Okay? Um, as a part of that exercise, they had the lawyers and the regulators involved, and what they said was, uh, you know, they, they essentially gave approval to say, yes, even though this is a, you've created this digital twin, because it's on a blockchain and because you've shown me that that data is private and you have full control over it, right, that um, legally in the event of a default, right, then that asset can be perfected to, to, to the owner. So that was step one, right? And that was really more around the regula regulatory and legal environment, okay? Now that step two is what I described to you is now that they've done that in their local markets, they, they're doing it across region. So the recommendation would be for, for a similar process in Korea to take Korea treasury bonds and show people that you can create this digital twin and, um, and, and, and automate the process just in domestically within, within the country um, and then expand from there. Yep. Hangugoro <laughs> Chimunagismida. CSD가 어프로치나 트렌드가 어떻게 다른지 그 부분을 좀 여쭤보고 싶습니다. Um, no, we do not see different different trends or approaches across the globe. It's the very common in in um, in under, making sure that they understand the data that's going to be available. If it's in a, given that it's in a decentralized environment, who are the parties that are coming in? But what, what, what is recommended and what we see tends to work the best, regardless of if it's a CSD or an exchange, is you really need to start with a, with, with a very narrow focus um, on your initial application. Too many times people try to do too much um, and it becomes difficult to, to, um, to achieve that success. So you need to, to start small by proving that with a, with, with a small group uh, uh, of, of trading partners that you can actually achieve the, the return on investment uh, um, as, as you're in, that, that you originally hoped to, to, to strive for. Okay? Then you will um, start to expand that in the marketplace as you scale and, and add others, okay? And that's within your own individual blockchain application. Then finally, the third phase would be what we've talked about, which is where you start transacting with, with other blockchain, you know, uh, other, other 
Canton-based block, blockchains that you can do natively, okay? But to start, it's very, very important that, that um, you, you know, you try to define a scope where you can, can prove something within six to, six to nine months. And, and, um, and we see that all the time and, and definitely work with, with um, many of our customers to try and scale back the, the scopes of those applications. Thank you. <laughs>